Okay, in this section of the course, we're going to look at the audit of groups of companies. When you did the F8 paper, the lower level audit paper, which may have been called paper 2.6 when you did it, the assumption for that course is that you're only auditing a single company. Now that we're doing the advanced audit course, we need to look at how things are going to change for auditors if instead of auditing one company, you're auditing an entire group of them. Now, fairly clearly, as you'll know from your financial reporting knowledge, this is going to create additional accounting issues. So, of course, we'll have goodwill, we'll have uh, NCI, what was formerly known as uh, minority interest, you're going to have consolidation adjustments, etc., etc. And we'll run through some of those issues shortly. But if you're nervous about this because you think the accounting is going to be a problem, to be honest, you can relax a bit. Because on this exam, we're more worried about the auditing issues. And whilst group accounting can get quite complicated, with a group audit, some of the biggest issues are actually practical issues. Issues that affect the smooth running of the audit rather than technical debit and credit type stuff. So what we'll do is we'll look at the issues in two separate parts. We'll start off with a quick reminder of some of the basic accounting issues and then we'll take a look at the more practical issues. Before we do that though, what sort of exam question might you expect to come up? Well traditionally, the exam question that has seemed to be the most popular is you have a client and during the accounting year your client has either just bought or is about to buy a subsidiary. Why is that such a common exam question? Well, as we'll see shortly, a lot of the problems with groups can be got rid of in the future. The problems really arise in the year of acquisition. And that's not just the practical issues, it's also, of course, the accounting issues, because in the year of acquisition, you'd have issues like goodwill. Now, that's not the only groups question we can have. There are other things that you could be asked about as well, but we can't really look at those until we've seen some of the issues that come into play. So, as a starting point then, let's just remind ourselves of some of the additional accounting issues that are going to arise if instead of auditing one company, you're now auditing a group. If your client is buying their first subsidiary, presumably then they've never produced group accounts before. So one issue is, I suppose, instead of now auditing one set of accounts, you're actually auditing three sets of accounts. Because now you have your original client, who is now a parent, the subsidiary's accounts, and of course, the consolidated accounts. So what additional issues then are going to arise? Well, in the parents' accounts, presumably you will have an investment. So we've got that to deal with. And then, of course, in the group financial statements, we've got all sorts of accounting issues to think about. We have goodwill. And, of course, that goodwill in the year of acquisition needs to be calculated for the first time. And that's going to involve some fair value stuff going on. You've got your NCI, if this is not a 100% subsidiary. Now, it has to be said that so far, at least, when groups have come up on this exam paper, they've been relatively straightforward groups. 
100% subsidiaries, which does make our lives a little bit easier. Your accounting knowledge for groups is tested on other exams, and so far, the examiners for this audit paper seem to feel there's no need to make the groups too complicated. You may also, of course, have to have some consolidation adjustments, intercompany balances being cancelled out, provisions for unrealised profit on intergroup transfers, and stuff like that. So those are the sorts of accounting issues that are going to arise. Uh, there are potentially some other accounting issues as well, but instead of looking at those in this section, I'm going to look at those in the practical section, because that's the sort of issues they actually are. Now, as I said a little while ago, um, a very common exam question is, your client has recently purchased or is about to purchase a new subsidiary. So what sort of practical issues does that create if in this accounting year you've got a new subsidiary? Well, potentially there are quite a few. For example, There's a fairly strong chance that the subsidiary purchased has a different year-end to the parent company. Now, that's not a problem, but it might create some extra work. Because if there is a different year-end, if it's not too different to the rest of the group, potentially all you have to do is take the subsidiary's accounts, time apportion them to create, in effect, the right 12-month period to consolidate. Because, of course, if the group is a December year-end and the subsidiary is November, you're going to need to take 11 months up till November and then one month of the next accounting year. And if it's a fairly predictable seasonal business, it may be possible to almost estimate what those extra one month of figures look like. If you're going to use the real extra one month figures, do bear in mind that the subsidiary has probably only been audited up till the end of November. So you may have to have additional audit work done to cover any gap between the year ends. Now, of course, if you're a company that's just bought another company, you want life to be relatively simple, I would imagine. So if it were me, and I'd just bought a company with a different year-end, as soon as I can, I'm probably going to change its year-end to the same as the rest of the group. The problem is that in the year of acquisition, you're probably stuck with it. And that is one of the reasons why this question comes up on the exam. In future years, year-ends will probably have been aligned. Made the same, in other words. But in the year of acquisition, you're probably stuck with a different year-end. Bear in mind, if the year end is very different, and it could be six months out, of course, you may have to get the subsidiary to produce two sets of accounts. One set of accounts to its proper legal year end, and that's the set it submits, and then a second set of accounts for the 12 months to the group's year end, and those are the accounts you consolidate. But if those are the accounts you're going to consolidate, the audit team will need to make sure they've audited those as well. So this could create quite a lot of extra audit work. Of course, that's not the only thing that might be different about the subsidiary.
It may, of course, have different accounting policies. Again, going forward, you would expect the parent company to try to align the subsidiary's policies with the rest of the group. But in the year you purchase it, you might be stuck with it. So again, in the year of acquisition, this is a problem. Now, there's no need for the subsidiary to change its accounting policies. It can stick with what it does. But of course, this will create consolidation adjustments because for the group accounts, you need consistency. So there we go, a couple of examples of things that might be different. There are, in fact, some other issues that could be different as well, but we'll come on to those in a minute or two. What other practical issues do we have? Materiality. Don't forget that accounting standards only apply to material things. And as an auditor, we only care about material mistakes. So it could be that there are material mistakes in the subsidiaries' accounts that mean the subsidiaries' accounts are not true and fair. But because materiality at the group level will surely be much higher, because you've got much bigger numbers in those accounts, something that is a problem for the subsidiaries' accounts may be immaterial to the group accounts. So you may have a qualification in the subsidiaries audit report, but no qualification in the group audit report on grounds of materiality. But it's not just mistakes. Potentially, in a very big group, one subsidiary may be entirely immaterial to the group's figures. And that's especially true if the subsidiary is purchased very late in the accounting year. Because its effect on the group figures is going to be fairly small, isn't it? Because from the group's perspective, all you're really getting is your share of what's happened since you bought it. So there we go, a few issues relating to materiality. But there is potentially one very big issue, and that very big issue could in fact then create a second very big issue when you're auditing a group. What if the subsidiary is overseas? If you've got a foreign sub, all sorts of additional issues now arise. So, of course, in the exam, you want it to be an overseas sub because it gives you so many more things to talk about. For example, presumably it's using a different currency to the group accounts. So now you have to translate. And trust me, that is not a lot of fun. Then there's the layout of the financial statements. We, of course, are used to seeing balance sheets or statements of financial position, profit and loss accounts, statements of comprehensive income, whatever you wish to call them. But not all countries follow that regime. In some countries, different layout. And of course, it's not just different layout, is it? Maybe the accounts are in an entirely different language. 
and that could make life very difficult when consolidating. Now, obviously, from an auditing perspective, you can deal with currency because there are accounting standards telling you how that should have been done. But when it comes to layout and language, presumably you need someone on the audit team who, number one, can translate this into your language, and number two, understands the layout of those financial statements. And if they're in a foreign country, Now, it's not just different accounting policies that's your problem. They could be following completely different accounting standards. Now, that is going to make the consolidation rather a lot of fun. And obviously, what I mean by that is it's not going to be fun at all. Realistically, if they're following completely different accounting standards, you may have to get this subsidiary to produce two sets of accounts. One set of accounts following its own standards in its country, and those are the accounts that that subsidiary will need to submit. But for group purposes, you'll probably then have to construct a second set of accounts with the right year end, the right currency, the right language, the right layout, and following the right accounting standards. And to make absolutely sure that those figures are correct, someone will probably have to produce a reconciliation that shows how you get from one set of accounts to the other, just to prove that they are both based on the same set of business transactions. And that, of course, is going to add a lot of time to the audit. So as you can see, a lot of these issues are in fact fairly practical rather than technical. And as long as we know about all of these issues, as we're planning this group audit, it should be possible to deal with them. And I'll talk more about the, the planning exercise for a group audit shortly. Now, I said that one big issue would create another one. It's not necessarily going to, and in fact, the second issue could arise without this one. The second issue is, if the subsidiary is based in another country, there must be a fairly strong chance that you are not going to be auditing it. It's probably got its own auditors. Of course, you might not be allowed to audit it because you may not be a registered firm in the country where this subsidiary is actually based. Now, you don't need a foreign subsidiary to necessarily create another firm of auditors. It could be that you are auditing a company in Britain and they have a subsidiary and the subsidiary is audited by another firm. And the other firm does a good job, the subsidiary is happy to stick with it, and the parent company is quite happy to stick with the situation as well. So, what happens in a group situation if I'm auditing the parent, I'm auditing the group accounts, but at least one subsidiary or in fact any other component of a group, it could be associates, joint ventures, things like that, what if one of those companies is being audited by a different firm of auditors? Why is that a problem? Well, if I'm the person signing the audit report in the consolidated financial statements, the group accounts, I'm the one responsible for that audit opinion being correct. But if I have not been the auditor of every bit of the group, this creates a bit more risk for me, doesn't it? How do I know that those subsidiary accounts are right if I'm not the one who audited them? So because of this responsibility, I cannot simply sit back and let this other firm do whatever they like.
I will want to see the audit plan for that audit. I will want to know what the other firm are planning to do before they start. I will probably insist on authorising that audit plan before they get started. Because if they're not planning to do the work that I think they should do, I'll either try and change them, or potentially I may have to send some of my auditors over to do some extra work to fill the gaps. But why might this other firm not be doing the audit the way I'd like it to be done? I mean, it could be a quality issue, but equally, maybe they are following a different set of auditing standards. And of course, if your subsidiary is overseas, if the audit firm is overseas, they're probably following a different set of auditing standards. So I'll want to get involved in the audit plan. I'll want to be involved at the end of the audit as well so I can see what the big issues have been just to make sure that I am comfortable with the audit work that's being done. And obviously, if this foreign firm of auditors are speaking a different language, following different standards. I need expertise in the audit team that understand all of this to make this process work well. In order to make sure that the overall audit in a group is done in an efficient, effective manner, it is typical for the principal auditors, the ones auditing at the top, the group, to make sure that all the other groups of auditors, whether they're from their same firm or whether they are from other firms, are following the same basic plan. So what I would do, if I'm organising lots of teams of auditors, is I would have a little instruction pack. This is often referred to as a consolidation pack, and it will tell all the groups of auditors what the deadlines are, what information you, as the lead auditor, want them to provide you with, and of course, by when, to try to make sure that every group is sending you stuff when you need it and in a format that is good for you. Ideally, of course, if all the auditors could make sure that intercompany balances between the company they're auditing and the other subsidiary being audited by somebody else have been agreed and therefore cancel out, it would make the consolidation so much easier, wouldn't it? So with a group audit, your main issue is about trying to make it work. Group audits that are well thought out, well planned, with every team of auditors aware of the deadlines, what their responsibilities are, should work okay. The actual consolidation process should be relatively straightforward because group accounts are typically put together by computers. And as long as they are following the right approach, the consolidation should be relatively problem-free, leaving the auditors free to deal with the higher level issues. Having looked at the main overall issues for groups, what we're going to do now is look at one or two more specific things that could come up as direct questions. The first one we're going to look at is a subject called comfort letters, also known as letters of support.
Okay, let's imagine that we are the auditors of a company, uh, and that company is a subsidiary, so it has a parent. The parent set up the subsidiary itself. Uh, the way it did this is by lending the subsidiary some money, uh, maybe some other assets as well, in order to get going. And the deal is that the parent is willing to let the subsidiary carry on trading and not pay back any of the money that was used to set it up, at least for now. So, this subsidiary is entirely financed by money from the parent. And for the time being, the parent is happy not to have that money back. Now, presumably, at some point, the parent wants the subsidiary to be able to stand on its own two feet and hopefully gradually repay this investment in it. You would hope. But as I said, for the time being, the parent is happy. As auditors of the subsidiary, we have a slight problem. When it comes to assessing if this subsidiary is a going concern, well, it's all down to the parent, isn't it? Because at any point, since the parent completely controls this subsidiary, the parent might decide it doesn't want to waste its money anymore and might shut the subsidiary down. Even if it doesn't do that deliberately, it may say to the managers of the subsidiary, you've got three months to repay the initial finance, and if they can't do it, that's the end of the subsidiary. So the going concern status of that subsidiary is almost entirely down to what the parent decides to do. So as auditor of that subsidiary, how do you assess going concern? And the answer, of course, is you need to talk to the parent, don't you? And find out what the parent's plans for that subsidiary are. Now, this is not the greatest evidence in the world. The parent might tell you today, yes, we're quite happy to keep financing that subsidiary for at least a year. In other words, making it a going concern. But just because those are their plans today does not mean that tomorrow morning they might completely change their minds and immediately shut it down. So you're a little bit stuck here, really, aren't you? All you can get is something in writing from the parents' management, the parents' board of directors, confirming that at present it is their intention to keep the subsidiary alive for at least one more year. And that piece of writing that you get from the parent is known as a comfort letter or letter of support. So, as with all management representations, it's not brilliant evidence, but to a certain extent it's probably the only real evidence you can find. You can look at the subsidiary's cash flow forecasts to see if it looks like it's going to be in a position to pay the money back soon, but at the end of the day, the parent could quite easily decide to shut the subsidiary down whenever it likes. Now, before we get too upset about the quality of this audit evidence, don't forget that as an auditor, your primary responsibility is to report to the shareholders as to whether the accounts are true and fair. And in this situation, the shareholders are, of course, the parent company. So when you report effectively that this company is a going concern, the people you're telling are, of course, the ones who told you it was a going concern. So if it does turn out to be the fact that a few days later they shut the company down, they can hardly blame you, can they? Because they're the ones who told you that they were going to keep it afloat. So that's comfort letters or letters of support. They don't come up very often on the exam, but sometimes they make an appearance for five or six marks. So just make sure you know what those are. The second specific issue I wanted to talk about is the concept of a joint audit.
With a joint audit, two audit firms are going to share the audit work between them and both will sign the audit report. Now I suppose the first question to ask is why? Why have two firms of auditors? Well potentially there are a few situations where this might be a benefit. If you've got a situation where you have a very large client, it may be you need two firms of auditors because the amount of work is so huge. So that's one situation. A second practical use for this might be where a company is changing auditors. Because if you're the new firm of auditors, isn't it a shame that all that experience that the old firm of auditors have built up has been lost? You could argue, therefore, that when an audit firm wants to leave, maybe they should stick around for one final year's audit, and at the same time the new firm comes in and audits as well. So you have a sort of handover process. It can also be useful in a group situation. Because if I'm the auditor of the parent company and there's a subsidiary in the group which is being audited by another firm and I'm nervous about whether they're doing the work the way I want them to do it, if they're following different auditing standards or anything like that, maybe a solution is that we and they jointly audit that subsidiary. That way, because I'm so involved in the audit, I'll be a lot more assured that what they're doing is actually proper audit work. So there are some examples of where maybe this might happen. If you go back to around about 2004, 2005, Shell, the oil company, was actually audited by both KPMG and PricewaterhouseCoopers. So these things do happen from time to time, and in some parts of the world they're more common than in others. Of course, if two firms of auditors are doing the audit work and both sign the audit opinion, this can have advantages and disadvantages. Advantages. If I'm a shareholder in a company, seeing the names of two audit firms, both saying the accounts are true and fair, surely gives me more assurance. Secondly, with two firms of auditors there, you've got the skills and experience of two different firms being input into the audit process, and that should surely make it a better quality audit. Also, if you've got two firms doing this, presumably there is a chance that if one audit firm makes a mistake, the other audit firm will spot it.
And there is also another advantage worth noting. As we'll see when we get to the very last bit of the course and look at some current issues, one particular concern in the audit world is that only a very small number of the very biggest audit firms tend to audit the world's biggest companies. It's not quite a monopoly or anything like that, but there are only a few very large firms of auditors and they dominate the market. PwC, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, KPMG, names like this dominate at the biggest company level. There is a concern, therefore, that the very biggest companies in the world don't have that much choice as to who they choose as auditors. And one of the worries is that as companies get bigger and bigger, the big four firms of auditors are getting bigger and bigger, and the other firms are falling behind. And if you've never audited a very big company, getting your first big company audit is very hard, because you don't have the experience. If we had a system of joint auditing for the biggest companies, it might be possible for companies to choose one big firm of auditors and then pair them up with a slightly smaller firm of auditors, which would allow those smaller firms, the Grant Thorntons, the BDOs, to get experience of auditing the biggest companies. And that might slow down or even eliminate this problem that apart from the big four, no one else is experienced in auditing big companies. Well, plenty of positives, but of course there are also some negatives. Imagine that when sitting your ACCA exams, instead of doing it on your own, I handcuff you to another student sitting the exam and you jointly create a set of answers that you're both happy with to hand in. Would that work? Well, on the one hand, you should be able to hand in a better set of answers because with two lots of skills and experience, you would hope that you are spotting each other's mistakes and filling out the answers with more detail. The problem, of course, are you going to finish the exam in three hours? It's going to take longer, isn't it? because you're going to be discussing virtually every answer, because you think it should be this, and the other person wants to write this. So, disadvantages. Arguments. Because those two firms will have disputes about accounting treatment, disputes about how much audit work to do, disputes about the entire process and method for doing the audit. And those arguments will, of course, mean extra time. It's not helped by the fact that probably both firms will want to do their own audit work on anything complicated. It's not like you'll divide the accounts up and let them audit those things and you'll audit these. You'll want to audit some of the stuff they're doing as well, won't you? Just to make sure.
And that, of course, means that the time of the audit and the cost of the audit is bound to go up. Of course, this links back to one of the positives, doesn't it? You're probably getting a safer, better quality audit with less chance of it going wrong. But, of course, quality comes at a cost. So there we go. Joint audits. Now, joint audits uh, have come up fairly recently on the exam. They are uh, a current topic. Uh, quite a few countries are considering making them either compulsory for certain types of firm or at least trying to promote them as a way of improving audit quality. So they have come up fairly recently, but as with many current issues, there's no reason why they can't come up again. Group audits then. Not a massive part of the course, but the problem with it is that whilst it's not a huge area, there are quite a few individual details that we've seen within that section. I suggest that for the exam you make sure you know this area fairly well, as group audits have been coming up more and more recently, and quite clearly are a favourite topic of our current examiner.